how wonderful is it to be live and in person again? How wonderful, yes, is it that we have the technology to be able to uh, live stream to those watching uh, at home, online? Big heart signal out to you. Uh, we love you. Uh, we're ha so happy to be gathered here today. Uh, for the folks uh, that are online, in about four or five minutes from now, we're going to be uh, having communion together. So this may be your opportunity to go get a chunk of bread and some juice. The lyrics of the song we just sang were open the gates and let your glory come down. Psalm 24 speaks of opening our gates and let the King of glory come in. And so, Father, remove the gates between us. Fill this place with your glory. We desire your presence here this morning. And it's not just the desire of our hearts. Lord, it's the desperate need of our lives. Touch us today, Lord, in Jesus' name. If I 
didn't get one, there's an usher in the back, and there's some right in the back in between the doors, you can grab one. And if you're watching online, I encourage you to go ahead and grab whatever elements you were able to grab together. Communion is a time where we get to remember what Christ has done for us, and it's specifically for a time for people who have given their hearts and their lives to Christ. And I forgot one more thing, I'll give you some instructions so that we don't make a big mess with these little cups. They are gluten-free for those of you who are interested. Um, at the very bottom of the cup is the bread. You can actually pull that off right now if you want to and just grab the little crack on the bottom. When you open the top, we do ask that um, you are very careful. And you don't have to take this thing all the way off. You just take it partially off and um, just halfway. That way we don't spill it everywhere. So um, really, communion is a time where we remember what Christ has done. And there's a lot of things that we do to remember things. We remember birthdays. We remember anniversaries. I remember my anniversary as a day that started a brand new journey in my life that has been so wonderful, 25 years now. It's a day of remembrance, that anniversary. We just finished Christmas where we remembered a moment in time. It's the Lord. But we remember the moment in time that changed history when Christ was born. And with communion, Jesus said, as often as you do this, as often as you eat and drink, remember what I did on the cross for you. And he wants us to remember that, not just because it was a horrible moment in time, because, but also because it was an amazing moment in time. When we were all able to basically stand here together with hope, and with forgiveness, knowing that we are holy and pure in his sight because of what he did on the cross. So here's what it says in the scripture. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. This is Paul. And he said that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's go ahead and take that bread right now and remember Christ as we do. Lord, we remember your sacrifice on the cross. We remember your broken body on the cross. And remember that that work was a work that you did so that we can stand before you in victory and in faith, we thank you for what you did on the cross. Paul goes on to say, in the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death 
until his return. Let's take this cup and remember right now. Lord, we remember again your work on the cross, your shed blood on the cross. And as we remember it, we remember the purpose and the reason. It's because you're mighty, amazing, deep, unfailing, never-ending love. And so, Father, we express our love and our adoration to you as we remember what you did. Thank you for your work on the cross, and thank you so much for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. You can take that cup, put it in the basket underneath your chair, and let's continue as we worship together.
highest praise. We bring you most high praise for you are a most high God. May you be exalted today in all that we do. In the name of Jesus, the Son of the living God and all God's children said, Amen. My husband, Tim, and I have been part of the Hopewell family now for several years, and I want to welcome you all this morning, whether you are worshiping us, with us here um, in our church building, you may have a seat, uh, or whether you're joining us online, welcome. Uh, to you, we're so thankful you made the choice. You didn't need to make the choice to join us here this morning, and you did, so we welcome you for being a part of the service this morning, and we pray that you will be ministered to, uh, whether you're here in the service or, or joining us online. Now, if this is your first time here, um, hopefully you all received a bulletin, and uh, at the bottom of the bulletin, there is a place, a little flap, uh, that you can fill out your information, you can tear it off, there are boxes in the back for offering, you can drop it in there, or there's a welcome center, you can drop it off there on your way out. On the other side, uh, there is a section for prayer requests. If you are joining us online, there is a place for you to uh, mention your prayer requests as well. You can find that on the e-bulletin, and you can submit your prayer requests. I was looking through our e-bulletin this week, and I saw under the weekly encouragement, it had the lines of the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. A lot of you know that song. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our griefs and burdens to share. Uh, what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. It is a privilege that we have to share uh, our burdens with the Lord and uh, just help allow him to lighten that load. So if you are struggling with something and you need prayer, it would be our privilege to carry that burden to our Father in prayer. And so please feel free to share those things. Um, belong class. Perhaps you have been attending here for a little while. And, um, you know, you'd like to get to know us a little bit more. We have a one-day belong class. Uh, it's this coming Saturday, January 23rd. And guess what? Today is the last day to register. And uh, I am not technologically inclined at all, but I figured it out. So uh, I'm thinking if I can do it, there is hope for all of you. Here's what you do. You go on our church website. You look under the events section. You just scroll on down. There's a real easy registration tab. Just click on that. And and uh, come and get to know us, you know, find out a little bit more about us. And this also is, uh, if you choose, a pathway to church membership. So uh, it sounds like it will be a very informative time for all of us. Now, it also, if uh, just one, perhaps you saw last week's sermon. Uh, if you haven't, I encourage you, go back, look it up, uh, listen to it, and maybe you did listen to it, I encourage you, go back and listen to it again. I think you'll agree it was an excellent, encouraging sermon that uh, Pastor Gary shared with us. In that, what he did was he shared our theme for this coming year, 2021, and the theme is Things Above, and it's based on Colossians 3.2. And so um, we are building so many of our plans for Hopewell based on that thing, on that theme, things above. So please go back and watch that uh, if you have a moment. Um, at the end of the service last week, you probably heard that uh, Pastor Gary mentioned t-shirts. So the good news is we are so excited about these t-shirts. Uh, they are, we are just looking forward to them uh, just unifying us as a church. And I think the most wonderful thing about all of this is that all of the proceeds we make from these t-shirts will go and bless a church in Ghana, Africa. It's called uh, Calvary Christian Church. They're looking to build a church, minister to people there, so we can unify ourselves here and bless them there. So that's the good news. The bad news is that uh, we had some quality control issues with them this week, and so we need to kind of uh, resolve some of those issues. They are not available today, but 
hoping that within the next uh, week or two, we'll be able to offer them to everyone. And we'll give details uh, at that point. Uh, if you are prepared, if you've come prepared today to share in, with, in your offerings, we want to say thank you so much. Thank for Thank you for your faithfulness. We are thankful for God's faithfulness to us as well. There are places in the back. Um, again, the offering boxes, you can drop that off um, online. You can um, go ahead and give through our app, our website. Real easy ways to give that way. So uh, again, we thank you. Thank you for blessing us in that way. If you are in fifth or sixth grade, you just go ahead and stand up right now. There you are. All right. It's your time to stand up, do an about face, head to the back. There is going to be a nice person back there. Oh, yeah, he's raising his hand. Yep, there they are. Uh, you go ahead. We have a special program just for fifth and sixth graders. You can go and be blessed. All right. Excellent. Okay. Um, I think that's about it of the announcements I have to share. Church family, if you go ahead and turn your uh, attention to the screens for the rest of the morning announcements, we would appreciate that. Thank you so much. Good morning, Hopewell. There are lots of great ways to get connected around here. Restore Community is a ministry designed to bring rest and comfort in the presence of God during the chaos of life. They meet the first and third Tuesday of each month. Come on out for this intimate evening of worship, prayer, encouragement, and fellowship with one another. A brand new series on the Holy Spirit is starting this week. Child care is available by signing up online. A new ministry is starting up this week. Coffee and Crayons is a group for moms with young children. They will meet the first and third Thursday of each month. Payment is needed to cover resources for child care, food, crafts, and study material. Child care will be available and help is needed to provide it. If you are interested in this paid position, follow up with Alyssa Thiel. Payment is not due immediately. Come and check the group out before fully committing. To learn more about what's happening at Hopewell, check out the bulletin or visit hopewellchurch.org. And remember, live well, love well, hope well. A reading from the book of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, whatever he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in Asia, grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves and has set us free from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the affliction, kingdom and endurance that are in Christ Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet saying, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, and with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. The hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery flame. 
His feet were like fine bronze as it is fired in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand. A sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Therefore, write what you have seen, what is, and what will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. My name is Gary Buck. I'm the lead pastor here at Hopewell. And as you haven't guessed, we are about to embark on a series on the book of Revelation. And um, I don't know if, if, if you're like me, but I'm one of those people who maybe I'm a little crazy, but I like to watch debates. I often go on YouTube and I like to watch two people from different viewpoints debate an issue. And I, a lot of times when I watch a debate, or many of us do if you're with me, um, when we watch a debate, a lot of times we tend to root for someone where we already kind of have an idea of like, okay, I'm already on this person's side, right? And I like to kind of root for that person. And then, you know, and, or sometimes when I'm watching a debate, I, I hear what one person says, and then when the opponent of my viewpoint says something, uh, I can't wait to hear what, what the person who I view as being on my side has to say now. And I, and I like to hear those remarks back and forth. And there's been times where I've been convinced of the other side through a debate, which is all, all, always a good thing. But, uh, you know, what, what, I, what always happens at the end of, of the debate is that each person who's doing the debate is given what's called final remarks. And what's interesting is that I always feel like it's an unfair advantage to the person who gets to go, what? Last. Because it's the last impression. It's, it's, it's the last word. Well, what we find in the book of Revelation is that God has the final word. There's so many voices. There are so many debates happening in the world. Are, 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 is anybody else sick of debating? <laughs> I feel like there's, we are at no loss of, of a need for more debates. But God, through the book of Revelation, he has the final word. If you ever see, and I've used this analogy before, but you ever see kids go like, yeah, nah, uh yeah, nah, uh and they go argue back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Well, God gets that last, yeah, huh. It really is true. He has the final word, and that's it. No one else gets to say anything. But the book of Revelation is probably not exactly what you might think it's about. It can be an intimidating or even confusing book. I talked to a number of people this week who heard we were doing this series, and they're like, oh, you know what, I just, I kind of read a couple verses here and there, and then I bail, because I just get, I'm just confused. And so I understand that. And so my hope is that as we go through this series, we'll be able to hold your hand through it and take you through it. And not only will you understand it, uh, but my, my hope is that it will breathe life into you and, and, and just take your faith to a whole new level because it really is an exciting, epic book. But it can be confusing. In fact, it's so confusing that we often find that many of us mispronounce the name of the book. It's not Revelations. There is no S at the end of, of Revelations. I actually just was watching a TV show this past week, and three people, hosts of a TV show, they all called it Revelations. It's just Revelations. So if nothing else happens to the series, and you just call it the book of Revelation, we have won. All right, that's a win, and I'll take that win. But when you ask what someone, if you ask someone, maybe on the street, doesn't even know anything about God or the Bible, if you say, hey, what, is, what is your perception of what the book of Revelation is about? What are they going to say? They're going to say maybe it's like, oh, it's about like the end times or the apocalypse. or That's kind of like this general idea because it's depicted often in movies. And, and you know what? The end time events are certainly a part of the book of Revelation. But the author of Revelation tells us right at the beginning what the book of Revelation is actually about. Let's look at it. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made, it known, sorry, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, 
who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, whatever he saw. So what's John saying here? What's the book of Revelation about? Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought about it that way? The book of Revelation is about Jesus Christ. In what way? Well, let's just look for, at the word that's translated here as revelation for a second. In the Greek, that is the word apocalypsis. Apocalypsis. What's that sound like? Apocalypse. Now, when you think of apocalypse, do you think of something that's good? If I said, this is going to be the apocalypse of all church services, would you be like, sign me up? No. What, what do we think of as an apocalypse? Something bad, right? Oh, no, the apocalypse. But w- look what's happened, how we've changed the meaning of this word. The, the, the word uh, apocalypsis, it simply means in the Greek, unveil, uncover, reveal, or to make fully known. Does that sound bad? No. And that's what the book of Revelation means, or the word Revelation means. It's primarily about the unveiling of Jesus Christ. It's a revelation about him, and it's a revelation by him. So it's, we get to more fully know who Jesus is through the book of Revelation, but we also more fully have it unveiled his story for us. So it's all, again, centered around Jesus Christ. I know a lot of people that have gotten wrapped up and obsessed with end-time events and understanding all the things that Revelation is about. But if you remove Jesus from the equation of the end-time events, it all falls apart. He is central to everything that happens in this book. So if there's nothing else you remember about this sermon series, is this, is that Revelation is first and foremost about the unveiling, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the unveiling of his glory and his story. If, think about this, though. If, if, if John is saying here that this is the revelation or the unveiling of Jesus Christ, that means that previously, our previous understanding of Jesus means that he was at least somewhat veiled, if he has to be unveiled. So in the Gospels, we got to see so much of Jesus' character. We got to see his heart for us, what he demonstrated for us on the cross, his resurrection. All those are amazing things. But there is something yet more that's unveiled and revealed about Jesus in the book of Revelation. I I believe this series is very timely. A lot of people have been emailing me or sending me questions about persecution, about the end times, about what's next. This book does answer a lot of those questions for us. But first and foremost, it unveils Jesus. And how many of you could just use a little more Jesus sometimes? I, I, I would rather know more about Jesus. I would rather be more intimate with Jesus than feel like I have more knowledge and understanding of end time events. I want more of Jesus. He's everything. Daniel Aiken, in his commentary on Revelation, said, I believe the theme of the book could be described as the majesty and the glory of the warrior lamb. King Jesus, who is coming again to rule and reign forever. That's good news, isn't it? That's, who, that's what it's about. So last week, I introduced our 2021 theme, which, was, which is things above. The things above, are, according to the author of Colossians, is Jesus and the things that surround Jesus, the things that are holy and good. And we can get easily distracted by our jobs, our finances, our, our relationships, plagues, politics, but... If our focus stays on Jesus, then we're just, we're going to be filled with peace. We're going to be filled with joy through everything. Now, many people draw peace from Revelation because it talks a lot about heaven, which it does, a new heaven and a new earth. We see a lot about what our future is going to be like here. But did you know, and I've mentioned this before, maybe if you were at any funerals that I've preached at, um, did you know that our, des- our final destination is not, first and foremost, heaven? It's not even first and foremost the new earth. What, in, in Philippians, the Apostle Paul, when he spoke of living and dying, he wasn't so much concerned about end time events or exactly what heaven would look like. He did not say, I depart this life to go to heaven. What did he say in Philippians 1.23? He said, I desire to depart and be with Christ. Jesus Christ is our destination. And that, 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 term, that word depart is a nautical term. It's like you're getting on a ship and you're going off somewhere. And so when you think about what's next, what, what, what happens to me after I die? And we talk all about heaven and the new earth, and that is true. We go to a great, wonderful place. But 
of first most priority and of, of importance and eminence is that we depart to be with Jesus. And so I think that's why so much of Revelation is centered around Jesus Christ. Paul's eyes were fixed on things above, which is Jesus Christ. And so, so it, for, and, and, and also the author of Revelation, his sights were set on things above. And the author of Revelation, we know his name is John. Most theologians believe it was written about uh, around the, the year 95 AD by the Apostle John. Uh, we, don't, we aren't 100% sure it was the Apostle John, but, but based on a lot of evidence, we do believe it was him. Now, verse 9 tells us that it was written by John from the prison island of Patmos. There's an actual picture of Patmos. We actually know where that was. That was. So uh, it, it's, it's kind of amazing when you think about it. The, the words we just we heard and we were going through here were written on this exact island. And it was a prison. It was, the prison islands were a very common theme in the Roman Empire. In fact, the emperor of Rome at that time sentenced his, I believe it was his sister, to a, a similar island not, not far from here uh, because of political reasons. That's, when people were a problem in their society and they didn't want to kill them, they just threw them on the island of Patmos. And so the reason that John was here, he tells us in Revelation 1, is because of the, the witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, it was illegal to do what he was doing. And they said, we've got to get rid of this guy. And so we're going to send him to the island of Patmos. I wonder, though, if Satan thought he had won a great victory when he sent John to this island. Because, but we know that God has a habit of working all things for the good of those who love him. So suddenly, you know, Satan's thinking, like, all right, I'm going to send him here. He's going to be, he's going to be in this prison. I'm going to shut him up. And suddenly, though, what happens to John? He's like, I got a lot of free time now. I got a lot less distractions and God reveals to him on this island this amazing revelation of Jesus Christ and the future and end time events. And I'm sure Satan was probably like, thinking, like, are you kidding me? Like, again? I, I think that I have a victory here, and then God does something like this. And I just wonder, I don't know, I'm not preaching a whole sermon on this. I wonder what Satan thought when he read John's words about his own future. Because Satan doesn't know everything. I wonder if that's how Satan found out about his own future was by reading the words of John. Revelation is a unique book. One of the, way, one of the ways it's unique is that it falls into three uh, categories. It's both apocalypse, it's a letter, and it's prophecy. There's no other book in the Bible that's like that. But there is another way it's unique. Let's read on. Verse 3. Uh, John says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy, and keep what is written in it, because the time is near. Revelation is the only book of the Bible that comes with a promise to bless those who hear it, to bless those who, uh, uh, who, who listen to the words, and the ones who keep it. The Greek word for keep means to conform your actions to something. Revelation is not just meant to be a comfort, but it is also a warning. Revelation demands a response. So my, my prayer for us all is that by the time we're done through this series is that we won't just know more information about end time events, but that our hearts will be conformed, that we will keep the words uh, that John has written. You see, when it comes to, I, I, again, I know that, that, that we're all fascinated with end time events and understanding what's going to happen, but we don't need necessarily more Christian conspiracies. We need more conformity to Christ. To be clear, much of what God revealed to John in Revelation was symbolic. And a lot of people have questions like, how much is symbolism? How much is actually what's happening? And so we don't necessarily have all the answers to what was symbolic and what was not symbolic. But here's what we do know is that even if it's symbolic, it points to a greater truth that's behind the symbol. So everything in the book of Revelation is, is, is true. It all points to a truth. We have to kind of discern what is symbolism and what is actually literal. And that's, that's what it is, a trick. But let's look back at the last part of the sentence that Paul says, where he says, because the time is near. So this is, this is why we're blessed are those who do all this, because the time is near. That, that, that phrasing of because the time is near is a very familiar phrase all throughout the New Testament. We hear about like, we are in the last days, the time is near, um, uh, we're in the last hour. You see, we should not be more consumed with the day of his return we should not be more consumed with that day than we are with the imminence of his return. If the church knew the hour of Christ's return, we would procrastinate. But if his return is imminent, 
we will anticipate. Let me show you what I mean by that. If, if you told me when, uh, when I was back in college, if you told me, like, hey, you have a test next Friday, guess which day I'm studying for that test? Thursday. If you told me there's a test one of the days next week, guess which day I'm studying? Today. <laughs> And I think that's why we are supposed to live in that way where it's like the hour is close. The hour is at hand. The church is always supposed to live and, and operate as though Jesus could return at any second. That's, so don't, don't listen to anybody who says, I know exactly when Jesus is coming back. Don't listen to them because they don't know. It, 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 no one knows because that, that's not the point. We are supposed to live, though, as though he could return imminently at any second. We must be ready. The second coming of Christ, it is close. That's a good thing. But we are to live as though he could come any second. John goes on to say that he is writing this letter to the seven churches in Asia. And those seven churches we know are in what's modern-day Turkey. We'll, we'll get to the seven churches a little bit next week, but we need to stop here and talk about just the number seven. And maybe you've heard this before, but the number seven is very significant in scriptures. Seven in biblical symbolism is considered perfect, complete, or whole. It's not just the book of Revelation. It's all throughout the Bible. But the word seven is used 54 times in the book of Revelation alone, including the seven declarations of blessing to the, blessing to the churches, the seven churches that are scattered throughout. So when you see the word seven in the Bible, just remember what that means. It's not just a nice special number. It means completeness, wholeness, perfection. So speaking to the church, as John then says in verse 4, he says, Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is to come. And from the seven spirits before his throne. There's the word seven again. The seven spirits before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. John begins here by glorifying the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You can't escape the cross. Even here in the book of Revelation, it's there right up front. And then he calls Jesus a witness, which is really interesting. In, in, in Psalm 89, it, uh, the, the term witness is used to describe what the moon does. It says the moon is a witness in the sky. And now that term witness is transferred to Jesus. And a little side note, it's interesting that Psalm 89 talks about the sun and then it talks about the moon being a witness. Isn't it interesting? How did the, he, the author of Psalm know that the moon was reflecting light off of the sun? No one knew that back then. It's just another one of those little amazing things that the Bible has. But now Jesus is called a witness. And the witness always points to something else, doesn't it? But the, but the word in the Greek there for witness is, is martus, which is where we get the word from martyr from. So first and foremost, we, we think of a martyr as someone who dies for their faith or who for, suffers for their faith. But that's not what it originally meant. It simply meant somebody who would do anything to be a witness or a, a, a reflect the greater light of Jesus Christ no matter the cost. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to die or suffer, although most Christians, if we live out our faith, are going to suffer in some kind of way, shape, or form or experience some kind of persecution. But that's what we are to be. We are to be martyrs. We are to be a witness of the light of Jesus Christ, just as, as Jesus was to God the Father. Now, there is some debate about who the seven spirits of God are, but most theologians believe that the seven spirits of God refer to the Holy Spirit, the one spirit of God. Remember, seven means perfect and complete. And so these seven spirits, or the one perfect, complete spirit, is all we need. And I think that's such an important message for us to remember, is that when we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, there's nothing else you need. His spirit is complete in all of his perfection, and, and, and all that you need, his spirit is perfect. That's encouraging to me. Today, you are filled with the Holy Spirit that will completely satisfy you, completely empower you, and comfort you with whatever you're going through. And then John says he made us a kingdom and calls us priests. That's such an interesting phrase, he, that, that we have been made a kingdom. You have been made a kingdom. Isn't that an interesting way of saying it? And that you have been made a priest. Not just priests of a home or community, but we are kingdom priests. In First Peter, we are all called a holy priesthood. This means that we reign, but that we also serve, which is a beautiful picture. And that sounds very Christ-like, doesn't it? We bear witness to the one who was, who is, and who's coming. And then John quotes Daniel 7. He says, look, 
He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I've talked to people who said, you know what, I just wish that if God was real, that he would just make it really obvious, that he would just show up in the sky someday or something. He will. He's going to make it really obvious someday. I mean, I think it personally it's pretty obvious already when I look at the evidence in science and nature, and the scriptures talk about that. But one day, it says that every eye will see him, and he will make himself completely known to everyone. But at that point, it's too late to say, oh, okay, now I believe. It will be a wonderful day, but a terrible day. And many people call that the great unveiling. It won't all be worship and adoration that day, because many will mourn, the scriptures say. And then something happens that we rarely hear in scriptures here in Revelation. We, next, we receive a direct message from God. Verse 8. God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. The Alpha and the Omega is simply, Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet, and the Omega is the last letter in the Greek al alphabet. And he says, I'm, I'm the one who is and who was to come. So in other words, he's like, I'm A to Z. That's what God is saying here. I'm, I'm A to Z. I'm not just the beginning. I'm not just the last letter of the alphabet. I'm also everything in between. I'm A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I'm the whole alphabet. Sing it. He's everything. He's all of that. And then just to be clear, he says, I'm the Almighty. A, a Christian man in a nation um, where it's illegal to be a Christian was recently asked, what are your two favorite books of the Bible? Or so he said, he was asked, what are your, what's your favorite book of the Bible? And he said, it's actually, it's two. He said, it's Daniel and the book of Revelation. And he was asked, why? Why are those your, your, your favorite books of the Bible? And he said this. He said, because they teach us that in the end, our God wins. Because everything that he was experiencing and going through, he had to hold on to that. That no matter, no matter how many times he gets hit down or somebody he knew or loved got killed because of their faith, he says, I have to hold on to the truth that in the end, our God wins. And then verse 10, John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. In other words, he, the Spirit was influencing what he was saying. And he said, and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet saying, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. This is the only time in the New Testament that the writer writes because of a direct command from God. I love how... Uh, the, 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 how John says that he, his voice was like a trumpet. Uh, do you know how loud a trumpet can be? Let me show you. I haven't played this trumpet here in a while. I did this as a kid. But let me just show you just for a second. It's kind of loud, right? That's one trumpet. Now just imagine for a second, you hear a voice that's like that. What are you thinking? All those years of lessons paid off. Knew for something. <laughs> but a, a trumpet sound it can be pure and it's unmistakable. And what follows next is that we find out that the voice belongs to who? Jesus. Do you imagine hearing a voice like that? You see, what's happened here is that even his voice is unveiled or revealed. It's a revelation of his voice. Have you ever known someone for a long time, and then all of a sudden you realize they can do something you didn't know they could do, or, or, or all of a sudden something's revealed? For instance, let me give you an example. Like, um, uh, the, if maybe some of you are familiar with the, the Lord of the Rings movies, there were, they, they filmed them in New Zealand, and they, they, all, the, all the characters had British accents, and, and they filmed this movie for, uh, the, the three movies for like over a year and a half, and one of the villains, uh, who, I forget which, who played one of the villains, but after the whole movies were done being filmed, um, you know, he had, a, he had a British accent the whole time, and then after the movie was done, he went over up, up to the director, Peter Jackson, and he just thanked him for letting me be a part of it. All, all of a sudden, he had an American accent, and P Peter Jackson's like, Wait, what just happened to your voice? And he said, oh, no, I, I'm, I'm from Kansas or something. Like, you know, and he's like, what? You know, he thought he was from, from London or something and, because he had a British, and he, because he never changed his voice, even when they weren't filming. When they go out to dinner, he kept his British accent on the whole time. No one knew he was from America. 
And so this is what's happened to John. He had, if, if, this, if, he, if this is the Apostle John, he was living and, and, and breathing and, and walking with Jesus. He heard his voice. And all of a sudden, he hears this voice like a trumpet. And he's like, that's your voice? It's the unveiling of Jesus Christ's voice. It's like he's hearing Jesus, his true voice, for the first time. It's amazing. And then, it says, verse 12, it says, Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. He said, When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man. This is so important. In Exodus 37, Moses talks about the seven branches of the lampstand uh, in the tabernacle. And Zechariah also had seen the seven branch of the lampstand that represented the eyes of the Lord. But later in this chapter, we see that the seven lampstands, Jesus says it. He says the seven lampstands represent the seven churches that he's writing to. And we'll get again to more next week. But the lampstands, this is important. Think about it. He, he could have had them been anything. He said it could have been like the seven concrete blocks or the, or the seven stones. But they're lampstands. Lampstands are what? They're lit. There's a light in them. The lampstands are lit, and this is the church. That Jesus, remember, what did he ask us to be? He asked us to be the what? The light of the world. And then John sees the Son of Man, which is, which is the common term for Jesus. But here, I love this. Where is Jesus standing? Is he standing to the side of the lamps? Is he standing above them? Is he, is, is he is behind them texting and just seeing what's going on? No, what's it say? He's standing among them. Church, this is a powerful image for us to remember. Jesus Christ is standing in the midst of his church. Do you believe he's here in his room right now? I mean, just because you can't see him does not mean he's here any less. This is powerful. I mean, as we're talking about these words, and I know we're, I'm on a stage, there's a screen, and stuff. This is, we are just a family here, and Jesus Christ is here in our midst and he's revealing things to our hearts, hopefully, by his Holy Spirit. He's revealing things to you right now, maybe, as I'm talking, that I haven't thought of yet. But he's talking to all of us and telling us all what we need to hear because we are a family. This is powerful stuff. The presence of Jesus Christ is what sustains us and encourages us. And now we get to the unveiling. This is, this, I love this. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ in all its glory. Verse 13. It says, The Son of Man dressed in a robe and with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. The hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze as it is fire, fired in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of, a, of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand. A sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. Again, think about this. Remember, this is, this is John's talking here who, who knew who Jesus was on earth and he knew what he looked like on earth. Again, if you think about this idea that if you think you knew someone before, I, I, there were years ago where I, I knew someone who, for years and, and we were going to play, a, he, he came to this thing where we were going to play a pickup game of basketball. And I'm trying to think how to say this nicely, is that he didn't look like an athlete. And, uh, and, and so he got picked last. And, and what, once we got on the basketball court, he was sinking three-pointer after three-pointer after three-pointer, led the whole thing in scoring. It was amazing. Everyone was going nuts. And we were all like, we had no idea that you were an amazing athlete or amazing basketball player. We had no idea. And I'd known this person for years. And this is what's happening to John. John's like, I knew that Jesus was the Son of God. I knew he was amazing. And now all of a sudden his mind is blown because there is now the full revelation of, of Jesus Christ and all of his glory. Jesus was so much more than what John thought he was. It says his clothing shows that he's our priest. He has, he has the priestly garments on. His hair, it's not gray, it's white. It's unnaturally white. And Daniel had the same vision of Jesus Christ in Daniel chapter 7, if you want to go back and read that sometime. And this white hair does not represent old age or decay. We have to kind of get that out of our mindset. Uh, it, 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 it represents the wisdom of an everlasting almighty God. You know, our society, we look down sometimes 
on, on gray, gray hair. I should probably dye my beard. We, we look down on, on gray hair sometimes because what, when we see gray hair, we think that that represent, represents uh, a fading of strength or, uh, or, or decay or, or aging. Uh, but Jesus doesn't have wrinkles. Jesus has white hair that shows this agelessness, this, this everlasting agelessness of who he is in ageless glory. And then John says his eyes were like flames. Could you imagine looking into the eyes, the all-knowing eyes of a furnace? Eyes like a furnace. And then John compares the voice of Christ to that of cascading waters now, or the roar of waters. And the, and the, the word water there is plural, and I don't think that's an accident. In other words, it, it's almost like if you can imagine, you know, I've been, I was at Niagara Falls years ago, and I remember like just being overwhelmed by the power. Have you ever been there? The power and the sound of the waterfalls down like that little boat, and the wind coming off of it, just the, the, it, the power of it was so profound. And what John is saying here, it's like many of those. It's waters. It's plural. Imagine many waterfalls speaking to you. And then John saw a sword come out of Jesus' mouth, which represents the word of God, we know. When, when Jesus speaks, it's like a sword that penetrates and cuts and separates. It cuts to the heart, but it also heals. And then he says his face shone like the brightest sun. What happens when you stare at the sun too long? It hurts, right? You can't stand it, and neither could John. Look at John's response to the unveiling of Jesus Christ. As verse 17, he says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. The important part of the sentence is that he says, like a dead man. Did he die? No. But it was as if he fell at his feet like a dead man. Why didn't he die is because he belongs to Jesus and he was covered in his blood. But even so, the glory of Christ was so overwhelming when he was just seeing him in all of his glory, it was like, he just was like, oh my goodness, like who you are. And then he just fell down and just collapsed like a dead man. Like he didn't even move. But this is, I love this. Look at what happens next, uh, in the next part of verse 17. It says this, he said, he laid his right hand on me. Just stop there for a second and think about that. He laid, laid his right hand on me. He's just in the presence of this profound glory and majesty and power and this voice like many waterfalls and all this stuff. And then he's like, and then I fell over like I was dead and I couldn't even move. And then it says, and he laid his right hand on him. His right hand is a symbol of his power. He laid his right hand on him. And then what's it say? It says, he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but look. He's telling him, look up, look, look. I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. I, I love this picture and this revelation unveiling of who Jesus is. He's both mind-blowingly powerful and overwhelmingly holy and good and all these things. And he's also at the same time gentle and kind. And he reaches to us with a touch. Isn't that amazing? He didn't have to be that way. If we could, wherever you are, just if you're, whether you're at home or in this room, just close your eyes for a second. And I just want you to imagine standing in front of Niagara Falls. Just, if you've never been there, just imagine what it would sound like. Just the sound, the power. And I'll just multiply that by 100. <laughs> Many rushing waters, just overwhelmingly powerful. And then imagine that all that power was coming from someone's voice. And the being, the person behind that power now reaches out and touches you. Brothers and sisters, we don't need more information about Jesus Christ sometimes. Sometimes we, we we're so desperate to know, to know more. And knowing more is good. But sometimes the answer to our fears, our struggles, our insecurities, our weaknesses is
is a touch. And God, all throughout the scriptures, has shown over and over and over again, he is an intimate God. It's the point of the cross, so that he could be close to us. He's not just after your songs. He's not just after you coming to church once a week. He wants to be close to you. He doesn't just want you to, he doesn't just want me to just read the Bible just to get my devotional in. He wants intimacy with us. And, and the beautiful thing here is that he comes to us. The scripture teaches that over and over and over again. He comes to us. I don't know about you, but I could really use a touch from the Lord. Can we just stand together in the presence of God? Jesus Christ is here. Jesus, you are here. Lord, we desperately need you. God, we thank you for revealing more of you to us. God, I pray that you would just continually, every day, reveal more of your glory. God, the scriptures say, show us your glory. And part of your glory is your touch. So Lord, right now, I pray that right now where we are, whether we're at home or in this room, that you would just reach down with your right hand of power and touch us. Lord, sometimes we need to stop thinking and analyzing and just receive from you. God, we receive from you. We surrender to you. We open our hearts to you, God. John said, blessed are those who hear these words. Blessed are those who listen to these words. And blessed are those who are conformed by these words. Conform us, God, as you touch us. May we be a witness for you. We love you, Lord because you first loved us. Reveal your glory in this place. As we sing this song, we are standing in his presence. Show us your glory.
song, I just uh, felt like there are people here who feel like there's some, something needs to change in their lives and they don't know what it is. But maybe just they just know, maybe if that's you here this morning and, there's, and that's maybe something, maybe you put it to words, but you feel like something needs to change in your life. And I do believe that maybe perhaps the missing equation for some of us has been that touch from the Lord. Maybe we've been studying the scriptures or we've been praying hard. But perhaps maybe there's been a wall of protection up or, or, or something we've placed up as a, as a source of controlling things ourselves. We won't let God get close. We're more comfortable knowing about him and letting him touch us. It's understandable. Lord, right now, I pray if there's any of us, Lord, who have put up walls to keep you at a safe distance. <laughs> Lord, I pray that those walls will just crumble down and we will let you in. God, the safest place that we can be is in your arms. Be touched by you. Everything that we knew needed to change suddenly comes into focus. And we're right where we need to be. We don't want to be anywhere else, God, except in your arms and in your presence. And we thank you, according to Revelation, that you are standing in the midst of your church. So even when we leave this place, you go with us because the church is not this building, Lord. It is where we go. Thank you, God. Amen.